I wish with all my heart that everyone fighting in this war could have come with me through the barbed wire fence that leads to the inner compound of the camp. Beyond the barrier was a whirling cloud of dust, the dust of thousands of slowly moving people. And with the dust was a smell of sickly and thick, the smell of death and decay, of corruption and filth. I passed through the barrier and found myself in the world of a nightmare. At the end of the Second World War, the full horror of Nazi rule was exposed. The Allies promised the world that they would bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice. 150,000 war criminals were named. Only 50,000 were caught. 100,000 of them escaped. This film is about one man, Antti Pavlish. Pavlish was no ordinary war criminal. He is the forgotten Führer of the Second World War. In Yugoslavia, Pavlish and his Ustasha party embarked on their own personal holocaust with the full blessing of Hitler and his Nazis. Pavlish's orders condemned half a million of his fellow countrymen to death, and he ranks alongside Hitler and Mussolini for sheer evil. We can now reveal how Pavlish escaped justice, in spite of being hunted by the armies of Russia, Britain and America. The Americans discovered a secret network that implicated the Vatican, two popes and Western intelligence. Pavlish is the key to that network, a network the Americans codenamed Ratlines. Good evening. Anti Pavlish was a particularly brutal and uncompromising tyrant. To understand how someone as notorious as Pavlish could escape, it is first necessary to appreciate the chaos in Eastern Europe in 1945. The Second World War unleashed a bloodbath in Eastern Europe. It was here that the majority of the civilians died, in the camps and the killing fields of the Holocaust. The Germans redrew the map of Eastern Europe, invading some countries and forging alliances with others, until the Nazi Empire dominated the entire region. In all of these nations, the Germans found willing collaborators, local nationalists inspired by ancient ethnic hatreds, who looked to the Nazis for support. Nowhere was this clearer than the Balkan Republic of Yugoslavia, where the Croat National Party was fighting for independence. From exile, Pavlish organized a pre-war campaign of terror and assassination. By his hand, two nations are plunged into grief. Within a few minutes, the end had come. Barely five minutes after landing on French soil, Alexander of Yugoslavia was dead. Pavlish was tried in his absence and found guilty of the plot. He found safe haven in Italy under the protection and patronage of Mussolini. In Italy, Pavlish founded the Ustasha, or Rebel Party, symbolized by the Croatian checkerboard. The Ustasha Party was a terrorist organization committed to the destruction of the Yugoslavian state. In secret training camps, they prepared for power, swearing their oaths to blood and soil. In 1941, the British backed a coup to topple the pro-German government of Yugoslavia. Hitler was furious. Operation Barbarossa, the assault on Russia, was delayed and the Wehrmacht turned on the Balkans instead. The Yugoslavian defences collapsed. The entire campaign took only 10 days. 
Hitler was so angry at the delay to his plans for the Russian invasion that he meted out special punishment to the capital, Belgrade. The conquering armies divided up the spoils. Yugoslavia was cut up like a cake. Germany's allies were all given territory. The Nazis occupied Serbia and Croatia became another puppet state. The flag bearers of Croatian nationalism were invited to form a government. Croatia was independent and Pavlic's dream of power had become a reality, but only with the blessing of Nazi Germany. Once in power, Pavlic revealed his true colors. The three-week-old government passed anti-Jewish laws that were even stricter than the Nazis. Within two months, the government turned on its old ethnic enemy, the Serbs. The Ustashi announced a program of deportation, Catholic conversion and extermination for the country's two million Orthodox Serbs. It was the beginning of four years of genocide. At a meeting in 1941, Hitler told Pavlish that if the Croatian state wished to be strong, it must pursue a policy of national intolerance for 50 years. The Croatians had the notion of, um, of um, f forced conversions. It was an idea that uh, had uh, seized them, and they pr proceeded to a program on their own to force Orthodox Christians to become Catholic Christians, namely of Latin rite. Armed Ustasha bands went out into the countryside and rounded up thousands of Serbian peasants. Mass conversions were held in the open. A group of Croatians or Ustashi would come into a village and um, address themselves to a little child and ask him to make the sign of the cross and the Orthodox make the sign of the cross in this way, touching the right shoulder first, and then this, the Latins make it this way. And uh, according to the story or legend or rumor, if the little child made the cross in the Orthodox way, that meant he was a Serb, and they killed him. Well, it was uh, quite openly a racist movement and they were particularly proud of that. And I mean, you couldn't have a better example than uh, Dr. Budak, who was the uh, Minister for Religion and Education, and asked by a journalist what his, um, what the government's policy would be uh, for the non-Croat racial and religious minorities. He said, for them, we have three million bullets. The Croatians had their own concentration camp at Jasenovac on the banks of the River Sava, where many thousands were murdered. They were killed with astonishing and primitive brutality. The victims were murdered in medieval fashion. Hammers and knives were used in contrast to the chilling efficiency of the Nazi death camps. On one occasion, in 1942, the camp guards made bets to see how many inmates they could kill in one night. A guard named Peter Brasica won by slitting the throats of 1,360 prisoners with a special knife. I think that even the SS and the Fascisti uh, didn't much like some of the things that the Ustasche were doing. Especially the ordinary German and Italian soldiers 
uh, were shocked by the lengths to which they went. When Pavlish met Hitler a second time, he boasted that the Jewish problem was solved in Croatia before Hitler had done so in Germany. Marshal Tito, leader of the Yugoslav partisans, poses for the newsreel cameramen for the first time. A thorn in Germany's side, he and his guerrilla bands have waged constant war on the invader. Hiding in a mountain fastness, these patriots strike swiftly and suddenly at superior Nazi forces. Many women are in the groups that time and again have won towns and villages against heavy odds. Brave men and women who will never bow to the invader or let Yugoslavia die. Yugoslav army advances. into the streets to greet and welcome their heroic liberators. The war was over. Pavlish fled in panic with a convoy of loyal Ustashi. Hitler's routed band, an army of assassins and killers, is taking to flight in a cowardly fashion. The Ustashas are running away with all those who have smeared their hands in their people's blood. They headed for the Austrian border. In May 1945, under the cover of darkness, they crossed over into the British-controlled zone here at Maribor. The British army on the ground, under the command of Field Marshal Alexander, apparently knew nothing of this. The most wanted man in Yugoslavia had just vanished into thin air. At Yalta, the Allies had agreed to repatriate war criminals, but in 1945, this was easier said than done. The shattered wreckage of conquered Germany is a graphic symbol of the desperate need of reconstruction in post-war Europe. Disorganization everywhere. Anti-Pavlish had disappeared into a Europe in complete chaos. From the Baltic to the Adriatic, Europe was awash with refugees. Millions were channeled into the camps, where their identities could be checked. Some were the victims of fascism, others were war criminals and collaborators. But who was who? People had been deported and displaced. They, were, they wanted to go home. Or, on the other hand, some of them said, that, why should I go home? My country is occupied by the Red Army, by the communists. Well, among the uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of refugees, there were undoubtedly some Nazis, Germans, or war criminals from J Yugoslavia, uh, or from uh, Hungary, for that matter. And uh, naturally, they didn't use their own names. If they had any papers, they destroyed them, and they passed for um, refugees. The war is over, but for them, there is still no peace. Some, no doubt, are guilty of crimes in their own lands. Others lived in countries which had changed hands during the war. Others, again, have suffered so bitterly in their old country that they are afraid to go back. It is true that the British and the Americans were on the lookout. There was a blacklist, you know, and they were on the lookout for these escaping Nazis. Now, how do you make a distinction between uh, that kind of an individual who was a, yes, the a needle in the haystack in the midst of this mass of refugees. 18 million human beings, race, language and identity, sunk in a common mess. Throughout 1945, Tito's diplomats demanded the arrest and extradition of Pavlish and his Ustashi henchmen. The Yugoslavs already had their hands on thousands of defeated Croatians, but they wanted the leaders, who had already crossed the border. The British Foreign Office and the US State Department promised their Yugoslav allies this would be done. Allied units combed the area under their control without finding any sign of the wanted man. In 
In July 1945, Tito's ambassador in London told the British Foreign Office... Pavlovich has been made prisoner by the troops of Field Marshal Alexander and is now in the part of Austria under the control of the British Army. The British Foreign Office categorically denied this. They told the Yugoslav Embassy in London... Every effort is being made to discover the present whereabouts of Dr. Pavlich. British intelligence informed the Foreign Office of rumours that Pavlich was either in Salzburg in the American zone or that he was in the hands of the Soviets. Austria was divided into zones between the British, the Americans, the French and the Soviets. But Yugoslav suspicions focused on the British zone. Throughout 1945 and 1946, their accusations became more detailed. Pavlish was in a villa near Klagenfurt. Pavlish was in a monastery disguised as a monk. Pavlish was seen near his family home at Bad Ischl. In August 1946, the British Embassy in Belgrade told the Yugoslav Foreign Office that these allegations were ungracious and unfounded. Pavlich has at no time been in British custody, nor has his whereabouts ever been known to any British authority. Three months later, internal communiques in the British Foreign Office admitted... It is becoming increasingly clear that many of the more important Quislings are taking refuge under the wing of the church. Thanks to the American Freedom of Information Act and the recently declassified documents in the US public archive, we now know how so many war criminals slipped through the Allied hands. Researchers in America, Australia and Yugoslavia have reconstructed the route taken by Pavlish down the rat lines. His story is typical of thousands of others who escaped. In December 1946, intelligence from Austria noted that it was more and more likely that Pavlish was in Italy and that his whereabouts were known to a Dr. Draganovich and no one else. Dr. Draganovich had offered his help to Pavlish in Austria and supplied him with false ID papers. In April 1946, Pavlich left Austria accompanied by a Nustasha lieutenant. Both were dressed as Roman Catholic priests. In Milan, Pavlich used the papers supplied by Draganovich to obtain a Spanish passport in the name of Don Pedro Gona. By May 1946, Pavlich had made his way to Rome Finally, it became obvious that he had found sanctuary inside Vatican property. Who was Draganovich? And what Vatican soil was Pavlish using as a refuge? Dr. Draganovich was a Croatian priest living in Rome. He was the secretary of the Brotherhood of San Girolamo, and San Girolamo was the Croatian college attached to the Vatican. I think there's no doubt that uh, many of the uh, Croat priests and clergy in the Croat College felt very strongly nationalist and therefore very strongly um, uh, inclined rather to overstep the mark. But Draganovich was also a man with a past. During the war, he had held an official position in the Ustashi government. Tito's Yugoslavia classified him as a war criminal. He was a Bosnian and rather... Uh, a super patriot, uh, super nationalist, better to be said. And uh, he took upon himself the mission of rescuing his Croatian confreres. And uh, he was terribly active. And, and of course, he was a prime target for the attacks of the Tito government after the war. And uh, I guess he deserved it. He was, course, he was terribly active. In spite of this, the Allies allowed him to enter the camps. In order to assure normal religious assistance to Catholic prisoners, as well as to exercise that mission of charity proper to the church. But what was Draganovich really doing? The mission's intelligence branch submitted quite an important report on the activities of uh, Father Draganovich and the Croat College. In the summer of 1945, Draganovich made a personal tour of the camps and made contact with the chief Ustashi representatives. A close liaison was maintained between San Girolamo and the Ustash groups throughout Italy and also in Austria. This led to the formation of a political intelligence service. 
Draganovic was also distributing false identity papers to the Ustashi faithful in the camps. The value of these documents in post-war Europe cannot be underestimated. The documents in question were International Red Cross papers. They weren't passports, they were identity cards. So-and-so says he is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, it was a on a piece of paper. It didn't guarantee that so-and-so, who says he was so-and-so, was really so-and-so. But in the bureaucratic uh, um, machinery, that it was necessary. There were two organizations that could help people with these papers. The Vatican Refugee Commission could vouch for an individual, and so could national representatives of the Red Cross. The Croatian representative of the Red Cross was none other than Father Draganovic. And the Croatian arm of the Vatican Refugee Commission was the Institute of San Girolamo. The American files on Draganovic stated, The Croatian confraternity issues false identity cards to the Ustashi. With such documents and with the approval of the Pontifical Commission, passports can be obtained from the International Red Cross, where Draganovic has some way of securing their issue. Ivo Omrichanin was one of these ways. He was a former Croatian diplomat living in Rome working closely with Draganovic. I personally could go either to the international, to the delegation of International Red Cross and procure a passport of such cross or to go to the Italian police in town to get them uh, either regular police papers or the Nansen passport. Thanks to Draganovic and the Croatian rat line, Pavlis now enjoyed a new identity and the sanctuary of the Vatican. The route from Austria to Rome started in the camps. Here Draganovic handed out false papers. It ran into Italy and onto the neutral territory of the Vatican, hidden from the scrutiny of the Allied Nazi hunters. In their pursuit of war criminals, the Allies were slowly piecing together an intelligence picture of the rat lines, particularly the Americans. Their investigation into false ID papers and Pavlish both pointed to Father Draganovic. Although Pavlish had evaded capture so far, CIC, the American Counterintelligence Corps, was not far behind. The Rome detachment of the Corps believed that they were on the verge of arresting Pavlish were it not for his Vatican protection. By 1947, the files show it was an open secret within Western intelligence that the Vatican was protecting Ustashi fugitives and hiding Pavlish himself. I think that most people in Rome who were interested in that sort of thing uh, realised that um, uh, San Girolamo and, uh, and particularly um, Father Druganovic were doing everything they could to get these Ustashi. Um, uh, high-ranking Ustashe out of, including Pavlich himself, um, out of Rome and uh, to somewhere safer. But a further shock was yet to come. Special Agent Gowan of the American CIC infiltrated a spy into the Croatian college. This spy reported that San Girolimo was... Honeycombed with cells of Ustashe operatives. In order to enter this monastery, one must submit to a personal search for weapons and identification. All doors are locked, and those that are not have an armed guard. A password is necessary to go from one room to another. The whole area is guarded by armed Ustashi youths in civilian clothes, and the Ustashi salute is exchanged constantly. According to CIC, Draganovic was also holding clandestine political meetings with senior ex-ministers of the Ustashi government. San Girolamo appeared to be offering more than just sanctuary. It was protecting a government in exile. In January 1947, the Americans discovered Pavlish himself had been in San Girolamo. By February, they traced him to the monastery of San Sabina on the left bank of the Tiber. The Americans convened a top-secret meeting on the 11th of April, 1947, to plan Pavlish's arrest. 
The CIC was determined to avoid a diplomatic incident and therefore could not arrest him on Vatican soil. I think that um, if the field security police had simply marched into the Crayat College, there would have been a definite um, breach of international law and a, a, a breach, certainly a breach of relations with the Vatican. Pavlish was living at an address in Rome that was believed to be a Vatican library. The file shows that Pavlish was always one step ahead of his would-be captors, moving from one Vatican safe house to another. When he travelled, he travelled in a car with Vatican plates. He managed to stay out of reach with the help of Draganovich, who had a spy of his own. Draganovich had uh, direct contact with that individual in the American secret intelligence who told him everything what Draganovich wanted to know about secrets of uh, uh, many other secret services. But these problems concealed the real obstacle to his arrest. In July, the CIC chief of operations ordered that Pavlish be taken into custody, on site. A week later, the same order was changed with a handwritten rider. New instructions, hands off. This mysterious respite allowed Pavlish to leave Rome on the last leg of the rat line. Pavlich uh, knew that I can procure uh, Argentinian entry visas without questions asked. When Draganovic sent a passport of the Red Cross, I did go to the Argentinian authorities, got the visa, turned it back, and so Pavlich could uh, leave uh, Italy. In the autumn of 1947, Pavlish made his way to Genoa with a false passport supplied by Draganovic in the name of Pablo Aranius, a Hungarian refugee. In Genoa, another Croatian priest was the last link in the rat line. Father Petranovic was wanted by the Yugoslavs as a suspected war criminal. He arranged passage on the ships going to South America and told Draganovic how many berths were available. Draganovic would then send that number of passengers from Rome. The final details of Pavlish's departure are shrouded in mystery, but it is known that he left Italy by sea and travelled to safety in Buenos Aires. By that time, this is after all two years after the end of the war, uh, I would say that there were very few war criminals uh, amongst the people in the camps. So, some may have got in there and taken a chance, but most of them had been smuggled out of Italy to a safer place. Because, of course, they all bobbed up again in the Argentine where they set up a new independent state of Croatia. <laughs> President Perón, now holding the rank of Brigadier General, reviews the Argentine Army and Navy. In Argentina, Perón employed Pavlish as a security advisor. Perón gave 35,000 entry visas to the Croatians to form a power block against the communists. A new leader for a key nation in Western Hemisphere solidarity. Why was the church protecting a man responsible for the murder of 500,000 people? Why was a lone Croatian priest able to protect Pavlish, a man hunted by every army in Europe? Why was the Institute of San Girolamo condoning his activities? Why was the Vatican hierarchy not in control of its rank and file? Or was it? Croatia was one of the Vatican's favoured nations. It was a buffer against the Eastern Orthodox Church. Pavlish's wartime regime was stridently Catholic. The Catholic Church and the Ustashi were hand in glove in the state of Croatia. Father Draganovic was on the Committee for Forced Conversions. 
Father Petranovich was an alleged concentration camp official. Archbishop Stepinac was a member of the Ustashi parliament. The Catholic support that Pavlish had enjoyed continued throughout his dictatorship. One of the first acts of the Ustashi government was to outlaw the Orthodox Church. It legalized deportation and murder in the name of the Catholic religion. Death squads even crucified some victims. After 10 months of these horrifying atrocities, the state opening of Parliament still received the blessing of Archbishop Stepinac and the papal representative Marconi. Archbishop Stepinac served at Ustashi ceremonies blessing volunteers for the SS, where the Ustashi symbol of the gun, dagger and grenade lay on the altar. Franciscan monks took an active part in the military campaign. Monasteries were given over to Pavlish and used as military bases. At the Yasinovac death camp, the commandant was even a Franciscan friar. Shortly after he ascended to power in 1941, Pavlish had a private audience in the Vatican with Pope Pius XII. Darcy Osborne, the British ambassador to the Holy See, was asked by the Foreign Office to convey its dismay. His reception of Pavlich is deplorable. It's done more to damage his reputation in this country than any other act since war began. The Vatican was unmoved. In 1942, Giovanni Montini, the Assistant Secretary of State, intimated to a representative from the Ustashi that the Holy See cannot imagine a Croat who is not a Catholic. In Croatia, Pavlish vigorously pursued this policy to make it a reality. In May 1943, Pius XII again received Pavlish in another private audience. I know the British, the Americans particularly, were. I, I talked to Ed, uh, Titman, the American charge of that night. He was quite perplexed and annoyed, irritated that the Pope received uh, Pavlich. Pavlich was a Catholic, no doubt about that. And uh, uh, if he comes to the Pope as a Catholic, the Pope can't refuse his, his and he was an important Catholic. Uh, so the, the Vatican's explanation to Titman was that the Pope did not receive him as head of the Croatian state, but as a, as a Catholic. But on the face of it, it, it looks, uh, you know, as if a, a sort of recognition, and obviously Pavlich, of course, played it up, you know, as recognition of Croatia. Although official recognition was withheld, the Vatican did receive Croatian unofficial representatives on many occasions. Pius XII even called Pavlish a much maligned man. The communist victory in Yugoslavia brought an end to the political power of the Catholic Church. Tito's new state had no place for the clergy. Members of the old regime were imprisoned or executed. Catholic Croatia was swallowed up by communist Yugoslavia. Although the tide of war had separated Croatia from the Ustashi, it had not separated the Ustashi from the church. The link was Draganovic. Draganovic was uh, a loud performer. Uh, he was seen everywhere. Everybody knew what he was doing. One of the priests working with him in 1946 gave a taped interview to our researchers. Monsignor Simchik revealed that Draganovic often discussed the work of San Girolamo with Monsignor Montini, Vatican Assistant Secretary of State. Draganovic would go and look for Montini, seeking advice for particular cases. Their relations were excellent. Draganovic would ask Montini to get more visas to open the doors for the people in the camps. On many occasions, Montini approached Draganovic and asked him to save people in danger, so there was a personal relationship. Did Draganovic know Pius XII? Of course, via Montini. And the Pope estimated him highly because he was a great man. Monsignor Montini was the Pope's right-hand man in the Secretary of State for humanitarian activities. He was actually operational director. So uh, he would have come in contact with Draganovic 
or with uh, uh, any refugees who would come contract within his own uh, limited uh, you know range of action and um, as we know he became Pope uh, Paul VI The Vatican hierarchy was allowing Draganovich to help Pavlish and other war criminals escape down the rat line. What did the Vatican hope to gain? American CIC agent William Gowan discovered that a secret anti-communist group called Intermarium held the answer. Intermari means between the seas, and in the 20s and 30s, a federation of Catholic states from the Baltic to the Adriatic was Vatican policy to fight the threat of Bolshevism. In the 30s, you know, it was, uh, uh, Stalin was a pretty powerful man and communist propaganda was extremely uh, um, potent and uh, Pius XI, who, was the, who died in 1939, was a vigorous opponent of communism and mobilized uh, Catholic um, organizations to fight communism and was he wrong? Of course not. Intermarium was a political group formed in the 1920s after the Russian Revolution. It was composed of Catholic nationalists committed to holding the line against the communists, a Catholic curtain across Europe. Communism was a threat to the church on two levels, on the theological, the theoretical, ideological level, namely on the theory that God doesn't exist and then that this modern society should be based on godlessness. And then the second, on the practical level of simple persecution. Stalin annihilated the Catholic Church in, in the Soviet Union, and uh, the Communist Party abroad was uh, uh, obviously following suit. If they could ever get control of, the, of uh, the political power, they too would follow the same pattern. So on this double level, there was perfectly good reason for the Catholic Church, and the, above all, and the leadership of, of the Pope, to take a very dim view indeed of the Soviet Union, especially under Stalin. In the East, the Catholic Church was fighting for its very existence. This life and death struggle drew it into the political intrigues of Intermarium and the Rat Lines. The final chapter in the Rat Lines scandal was exposed to Gowan and the CIC by the confessions of a former Hungarian Nazi war criminal, Ferenc Vida. As an informer, he could hardly have had better credentials. Before the war, he had been an active member of Intermarium, and he had escaped to Rome down the rat line. His story contained remarkable revelations. He claimed British and French secret services were involved with Intermarium before the war, funding its activities and protecting its agents. When the Ustashi assassinated the King of Yugoslavia, the British had protected one of the plotters, Pavlish's right-hand man, Artukovic. Artukovic later became Minister of the Interior in wartime Croatia and a British agent. Intermarium had attracted the pre-war attentions of the British as a ready-made anti-Bolshevik organisation. Britain's secret intelligence service was widely regarded to be nationalistic and fiercely anti-Bolshevik in its aims. Sir Stuart Menzies, who became head of SIS in 1939, was a staunch anti-Bolshevik himself and a member of the British elite. Before war broke out, some members of the British elite were openly pro-fascist and supported Hitler. They saw the Nazis as the protectors of Europe, defending it against communism, and used their powers and influence to say so. The doyen of this group was the Duke of Windsor. Accompanied by Dr Ley, the Duke begins his tour of inspection of industrial conditions with a visit to a suburban factory and he has explained to him in detail Germany's methods of organising labour. The war inflicted a deadly blow to the hopes of a Nazi-British pact against the Communists. In fact, by 1945, all hopes of containing Communism had vanished. The Red Army liberated Eastern Europe from the Nazis and occupied it themselves. Local nationalists, the Vatican and the West, all had to face the fact that Stalin was now in charge. The countries of Intermarium became the communist bloc. The war had turned the dream of a Catholic curtain into the reality of an Iron Curtain. The war was a brief interruption in the fight against the communists. The communists are red 
fascists, Stalin will not stop of his own volition. He can only be stopped. The Yugoslavs had been right. Pavlish had been protected by anti-communists in the Vatican. The Yugoslavs had also pointed the finger of suspicion at the British. Had they been right? In 1945, the British and French secret services revitalised their links with the fascists, just as the Vatican had done. Gowan reported that when Pavlish crossed into Austria... He was protected by the British in British-guarded quarters for a two-week period. Due to the inevitable embarrassment of British command, he then left these quarters but remained in the British occupation zone for two or three months more, still in contact with the British intelligence service. Gowan further stated that... A British lieutenant colonel was put in charge of two trucks laden with the supposed property of the Catholic Church in the British zone of Austria. These two trucks entered Italy and went to an unknown destination. This was the treasure that had been taken by the Ustashi in their flight from Zagreb. Some of the gold never left Yugoslavia, and it was later found in a Franciscan monastery. This was the gold stolen from the murdered victims of the Ustashi. The treasure that did leave was placed in the hands of Father Draganovic. Draganovic uh, was saying that the money will be used for the liberation of Croatia. Copies of Free and Tamari were circulated in the displaced persons camps in Austria and Italy, and a Ustashi radio station was operating from inside the British zone. Well, I think uh, that uh, it was very difficult for anybody to keep uh, adequate control over the camps partly because there weren't the men to do it with. But what they did manage to do, I think the DPs, or quite a lot of them, uh, was to um, set up a regime and administer themselves, a regime of their own. Uh, you could uh, buy a Tommy gun on the black market uh, for a kilo of coffee. And that uh, enabled quite a lot of them to arm themselves. And there were deserters and brigands of one kind or another living in the hills. And that was exactly what the Allied governments, British government certainly, wanted to put a stop to. In 1947, a deal was made with Tito. The Allies would return high-ranking Ustashi, but not the rank and file. One of the negotiators was Brigadier Fitzroy MacLean. Hunting war criminals was not top of the Allied priority list. My job was to take a team to identify these people and as far as possible, to get those who hadn't got anything against them, who were not, uh, couldn't possibly be regarded as war criminals, uh, to, to find somewhere, get them out of Italy, and relieve the pressure on the Italian government to return them. The camps were full of anti-communists, with wartime experience of fighting the Soviets. They proved to be fertile ground for recruiting into Mariam agents including wanted war criminals. It uh, started that the British uh, funded, funded uh, the action and therefore all money given to the intermarium was coming from Britons. It now appeared to Gowan that the British SIS were behind the Vatican's evacuation of the Ustashi leader and the revival of intermarium. Vida's story alerted the Americans to the potential of Intermarium as a ready-made anti-communist network. Gowan promptly told his superiors. The most outstanding feature of these complex activities is the inability of these anti-communists to find a stable base for their operations. It is the opinion of this agent that friendly coordination by the United States would build a firm base for the future. The U.S. were joining the recruitment drive for these anti-communists. The practical problem was how to protect these recruits from the constant danger of kidnap and arrest by the communists. Trials in Yugoslavia highlighted the danger. Archbishop Stepanaci's show trial was used as a propaganda platform to accuse the Vatican, the Ustashi and the West of plotting against the communist state. The Americans needed a secret way of getting their new friends out of danger and they turned to Father Draganovic. CIC sent the people without saying anything. CIC would say, here the people, 
and we say, fine, come. And then the people say the, their names, new names probably, and got the papers and uh, slowly sent out with uh, regular Croatian ways. Uh, Americans supplied about $1,000 for each individual. The inconceivable had happened. The victorious allies were helping fascist war criminals escape under the cover of the Vatican rat lines, often disguised as priests. Draganovic now had U.S. backing. The agreement consists of simple mutual assistance. These agents assist persons of interest to Father Draganovic, and in turn, Father Draganovic will assist persons of interest to this command. Some of these persons may be of interest to the denazification policy of the Allies. Therefore, this operation cannot receive any official approval. Alan Dulles and James Jesus Angleton, who were later to rise to the top of the CIA, used the rat line to smuggle Nazi scientists and intelligence experts from Germany itself. We now know this is how Klaus Barbie escaped to Bolivia. Barbie was known as the Butcher of Leon and was wanted by the French. After the war, he was recruited by the Americans and worked for CIC in Munich. The French discovered this and demanded his extradition. The CIC gave instructions that Barbie was not to be handed over whatever the US State Department might say in public. Barbie knew too much. French conservatives could be embarrassed because he might reveal that some of de Gaulle's colleagues had been Nazi informers. Specifically, Barbie threatened to expose that he got information from Francois Ponce during the war. It was a smear that would provide French communists with a spectacular propaganda coup. Francois Ponce had been de Gaulle's representative to the International Red Cross and was the French High Commissioner for Germany. Rather than embarrass conservative friends in France, Dulles sent Barbie down the rat line. When Barbie met Draganovic, he asked him why he was helping. Draganovic replied that he was saving Nazis and anti-communists because we've got to keep a sort of reserve on which we can draw in the future. Draganovic continued to um, uh, be a practicing priest while he was doing uh, what he could for the Ustasha. And I think uh, had been an active part of the uh, active member of the Ustasha movement from the beginning. Father Draganovic was not alone. Clerics from Germany, Italy, Austria and Hungary all had their own rat lines. The crimes of the Second World War were well known to the Vatican, but still they allowed their priests to protect the guilty. Why? What did the Vatican gain? The Vatican was exploited by some of the worst war criminals of the 20th century, but it was exploited willingly. Paranoia about communism made the leaders of the Catholic Church blind to the difference between good and evil. They betrayed the faith of millions. The Vatican, in the name of Christian charity, was saving war criminals. What did the Allies gain from Operation Ratlines? The intermarium network they rekindled after the war was riddled with Soviet spies. The man appointed by the British to head secret anti-Soviet operations, including the recruitment of Nazis, was Kim Philby. Philby defected to Moscow in 1963. The CIA had to re-examine all security clearances given to the Nazi fugitives by MI5 and MI6. More than a decade of Cold War operations was hopelessly compromised. What did anybody gain? The only winners were the thousands of wanted war criminals who escaped via the rat lines. They left Europe devastated by their crimes and were given new lives and identities in return. It was their reward for fighting the communists before, during and after the Second World War.